So my name is Suji Matthew. I'm one of the infectious disease doctors here at Clearview. And um, really, vaccinations are given by all primary care doctors pretty much. My purpose here is to answer any questions you may have and uh, just to educate you about the reason and why we do it. I'm sure a lot of you know most of this. It's quite an elementary talk, but nonetheless, it's a good way to start a discussion. Right. So really, very simply, um, how do vaccines work? So the idea of vaccinating someone is to reduce the risk of infection. So what we actually do is work on the body's own immune system. So if you look at this, these are these dead or weakened viruses or bacteria that we inject. These Y-shaped things are the antibodies the body produces um, in response to that particular vaccine. So once you have these antibodies in your system, the next time you actually get the true, exposed to the true disease, um, the body is now primed to produce a good immune response to fight the infection. So essentially, it's like a training exercise for your body. The body gets an idea, this is what it will look like, this is what I need to produce so that when they actually get exposed to it, the body ramps up its machinery to bring about a really good response to fight the infection. Um, again, just to show it schematically, so if you look at the blue people, these are the not immunized, but they're the healthy people. The red folks are the ones who are carrying the disease and they're sick. Uh, if no one's vaccinated, which is your yellow folks, most almost everyone will end up with the disease. Now, if you have a few people who are vaccinated in the community, of course, you can contain the infection better. And then the more people that get vaccinated, we, of course, protect a greater number of people. As you can see, um, there were a couple of sick people, and really, most of them could fight the infection. And the blue folks, again, here show you that not everyone who's exposed to an infection will end up getting it. There are a lot of factors that come into play. Vaccine is a big part of it, but of course it's also how your body responds to the vaccine. Your own health status, how many other health problems do you have? Are you a transplant patient? So there are a lot of other factors that come into play, and there are some healthy people who may never get an infection. But nonetheless, the idea is to say for most of us, Getting a vaccine helps us fight the infection and therefore it is a good idea, and especially as we get older. So this is a really busy slide, but one of the main things that I want to talk to you all is a lot of these are the adult vaccinations. And I am going to cover a few of these, the influenza, the Tdap, or the tetanus. Um, we'll talk about the shingles vaccine. And uh, just a couple uh, of these, but what a couple of the others. And the rest of it really are vaccinations that most people get in childhood. And then if you haven't gotten it, uh, for example, the varicella vaccine, which is the chickenpox vaccine, most kids will get it now. If you haven't received it, um, if you're an adult, uh, you are offered it, depending on many factors, including what line of work you choose. So healthcare workers, are considered a different group altogether because of the fact that you're exposed to a lot of this. It is recommended they get a lot of these vaccines. But you know, at your at, at this point, what you all would need is really the shingles vaccine, not really the varicella, because you're out of that particular um, age group. So um, you know, this is one of the things, and I'm glad you all are here. I, I hope. You will leave from here wanting to educate others who are leery of taking the vaccines because this is just to show the fear factor that people have. Vaccines have gotten a bad rap, and it's the worst when young kids are not immunized. And if you look at this picture, it shows you a whooping cough, which is the pertussis vaccine we'll talk about in a little bit. You know, you hardly had any cases of it. But the more parents are afraid of vaccinating their kids, um, we're seeing more of measles, whooping cough, things we really have thought we were doing pretty good controlling these infections. So a lot of this has to do with the fact that, um, you know, when uh, parents are concerned, not understanding why this is being done, choose not to vaccinate their kids, and then, of course, it spreads through um, the community. 
Um, so the first vaccine we are going to talk about is Tdap. This is a combination of tetanus, diphtheria, and pertussis. Pertussis is the whooping cough. Typically, at 11 or 12 years of age, most children today will get it. If you haven't received it at that age, it is recommended to get at least one dose of this. Now, a lot of you may have heard of the tetanus alone, and that's fine to get every 10 years, but this is something you want to get at least once in your lifetime if you've never received it. And why is it so important? So it really isn't as much for you as much as it is if you are going to come into contact with infants or your grandkids or any kid that's really below age one. What happens is these little kids can die of whooping cough. Now most of us who get it may just have an aggravating, annoying cough that lingers on for a few weeks, but not necessarily die from it. But the infant who's two months who hasn't yet been immunized, if, if exposed, so say you have it, and you're taking care of your grandkid or your neighbor's kid or someone coming over, and they can get it from you and potentially die from it because they are too young to get that vaccine in that age group. I don't know if that, that sort of, so the idea is that if grown-ups would take it, we would protect the infants who come in contact with us. Any woman who is pregnant will get it with the same logic that when she has her infant, that if she acquires whooping cough, her child will not die from it because the mother will protect the child and the child is too young to get the vaccine him or herself. So that's really the logic of getting this vaccine. Uh, everybody, everyone should get one dose of it if you haven't. And then uh, after that, every 10 years, you can continue with the tetanus vaccine which is your vaccine to prevent against uh, tetanus infection if you ever get a wound. Um, the next vaccine is shingles. Uh, most of, so this, the VZV or the varicella zoster virus, this is the virus that causes uh, chicken pox in the very young. And what happens to this virus is that it stays around in our nerves. And then when we get older, say in a very stressful situation, or if you are sick from pneumonia or for another reason in the hospital, this virus gets reactivated. What that means is it now gets sort of ammunition to cause shingles. And that's nothing but those painful blisters that if any of you have had, or you'll never forget because they are these little clusters of grape-like vesicles that come on areas of your body. And the worst thing with it is the pain associated with it. Really, it isn't as much the shingle. So this is a good vaccine to get um, for anyone who hasn't received it. It is recommended for everyone 60 and older. Um, FDA does approve it for 50 and older. But uh, since the immunity, the protection, wanes in five to eight years, so ideally it is preferred if you get it later, so you are protected for at least an additional eight to 10 years. And if you're wondering why not take it once and take it again, well, we don't have enough studies to show is there any benefit from repeating it 10 years later. All we know at this time is we encourage everyone to take it once after 60. If any of you have had shingles before, you can still take the vaccine. Yeah, and, and the reason being, you can get a different strain of the virus and that will protect you. So even if you've had it before, you can get the shingles vaccine. And um, the only thing to remember it is, it is that it is a live vaccine. So whenever we mention live, what that really means is there are certain groups of people who should not get this vaccine. And that, and that includes anyone who's pregnant, anyone who is... Um, basically on immunosuppressive medications, and this includes anyone who's had a liver transplant, lung, kidney transplant, because these kinds of medications weaken the immune system, and we try not to use live viruses for this particular group of people. But if you don't fall in this category, this is definitely a vaccine that, that you should take. Yeah, I just found out this year, I'm on Scalara for psoriasis, and I went in to get it, and they said, you know, you can't have any Lyme. That's a good so point. So which is better? Should I drop the Scalara and get the shingles, or? 
So, um, and that's a very good point you raised. A lot of rheumatological conditions, psoriasis, where they use these medications that totally not weaken the immune system, uh, you are not eligible for live vaccines. So here's how I look at it. If you have, you take it for psoriasis, would you take, so how bad is your psoriasis? If you don't take the medication and the psoriasis gets really bad, I would recommend take the medication that controls your psoriasis and don't worry about the shingles vaccine because uh, if your psoriasis totally gets out of control, um, you are going to be more susceptible for bacterial and other infections, so it's not really worth it. So if that's keeping it under control, don't worry too much about it. Um, so that's a very good point you brought up. So this is just, so again, any vaccine, always discuss it with your physician. The CDC is a very good place to read up about vaccines. They have a lot of information that is patient pertinent, answering simple questions, and, and then you're armed with information to talk with your doctor if you have specific concerns. Did you have a question? I had a uh, single, probably eight or ten years, nine years ago, I'm 93 years old, and um, I asked him, uh, should I take the shingle now? And he did a blood test. He said, I'll do a blood test. I don't know what the blood test was, but uh, he came back and said that, uh, I, I don't know if so long, I don't remember, he just got the word, but he didn't recommend taking it. And I think there may be a couple of things. One is that you did acquire it. Now, he can check antibodies to the virus. And if you are protected against it, then, you know, that, that's good. You don't need the vaccine. Um, and if you're wondering, then why doesn't everyone just do the blood test? Really, the blood test is more expensive than the vaccine. So it's not really worth doing it. But in your case, I think because you had hit 90, potentially a doctor was thinking, why introduce a live vaccine? Um, and it may not really be beneficial. So there are individual cases that, of course, you know, every case is different, but for the vast majority it works. So um, you really don't need to do a blood test. For most of us who got chicken pox as a kid, it's okay to get the shingles vaccine. All right, so what is the most effective method to prevent the flu? You know where this topic is going. That's good. And since it's a topic on immunization, what is the one thing to do to prevent the flu? The flu shot. Exactly, yeah, take the flu shot, right? So, we, you're right, and all those other answers are correct. Wash your hands is a simple, effective, excellent technique. Staying away from people who have, you know, if you're, you don't want someone coughing in your face. or So, um, really, those are all good. But again, uh, flu vaccines are just very, very effective. So, um, I don't know how many of you are aware, but when you take the flu shot, it takes about two weeks for the vaccine to kick in. So, if you are planning a cruise and you take the shot today and then you say, geez, I got on the cruise and I got the flu, what use was the vaccine? The problem is the vaccine really didn't protect you yet. So, keep that in mind um, to take it early on in the flu season. And by taking it early on, you are going to protect yourself for, you know, a much more major part of the season. Um, a lot of people who are worried saying, geez, with the flu vaccine, I got the flu. Really, that is quite impossible. It is a killed or a weakened virus. The way you could have acquired the flu is really you were in that period when the vaccine didn't protect you yet. And you got exposed to somebody who had the flu. So that is one thing to keep in mind that, um, you know, it takes a certain period to be protected. Flu activity in the U.S. is highest between um, December and February, and it can last as long as May. So as long as there are viruses circulating, it, it really isn't too late to get vaccinated. People at high risk for serious flu complications are the very young pregnant women people with certain chronic health conditions like asthma, diabetes, heart disease, and then of course 65 and older. And um, when we say the high risk of flu complications, we're really talking about pneumonia, encephalitis or brain infection from the virus, um, and of course, um, you know, potentially being sick enough to cause death. <clears throat> so here's another question. Why do you think you need the flu vaccine every year? Because a lot of our vaccines, we do it once, and then do, do you have an idea of 
why the flu vaccine is required every year? Different kinds of flu. That's right. So here are your choices. A, flu viruses are always changing. B, the vaccine is updated every year to better match what's circulating. C, the immune protection from vaccination declines over time. So it is recommended every season for the best protection. D, so vaccine companies can make money. <laughs> and E, A, B, and C. E. E. And that's right. So every year you are required to take the flu vaccine basically because CDC gets together with the, uh, the scientists and the companies to decide which are the three or four most common circulating strains. And that is what's combined for the next flu season. So this is a process that really happens. This flu season is when they're deciding based on what's circulating for the next flu season. So it's, it is a long process. And uh, we have, typically you will hear terms like trivalent or quadrivalent. Tri implying it has three strains of the flu virus, and quadri meaning it has four strains of the flu virus. Now, um, basically, you either is recommended, CDC doesn't pick one over the other. Okay, so um, it is recommended that everybody get the flu shot every year. Again, this is just the CDC website that gives in detail what are the different vaccines that are um, available for, I don't know why I did that. Um, so this particular slide, just two things to point out. We have different kinds of vaccines for the flu season for those who have egg allergy or very concerned about vaccines that are grown with egg protein in mind, you can use what's called a recombinant vaccine, which has nothing of the egg protein in it. So that is one way to allay a fear if you don't want a vaccine with egg components. And then the two other things to remember are there are two stronger vaccines for the flu recommended for people above 65, but talk to your doctor. It's just a higher dose of the virus or a different protein attached to the virus to just help bring about a better response in the body. They think that above 65, you may not get as good a response, say, as someone below 65. So uh, the idea is that they have made two different kinds of vaccines which are with adjuvants added to it just to make a bit, get about a better immune response. Um, now, who should not get the flu vaccine? Uh, anybody who has had a severe life-threatening allergic reaction to any part of the flu vaccine in the past. Uh, if you've ever had Guillain-Barre syndrome, this is a neurological illness where you have weakness of your arms and legs, you may have trouble breathing, you will almost always end up in the hospital or the ICU. So that is definitely um, not someone who should be taking it. And if you're not feeling well, now it is okay to get the flu vaccine if you're a little under the weather. My personal preference is get it when you feel good. Because you never want to come back home, be sick for a week, and think the vaccine did it. At least if you start on a fresh state, you know, you know, really, this is not the flu vaccine that made me sick. So my personal preference is that you go when you're feeling good, but uh, it is okay to get it as long as you don't have a high fever. <clears throat> So again, this is just to say the high-risk people, what CDC did show that in previous flu seasons, 80 to 90% of deaths related to the flu and 50 to 70% of hospitalizations occurred among those who were 65 and older. Again, this is the reason to stress getting the flu vaccine um, only because of the risks associated with older age. Okay, we'll move on to the pneumonia vaccine. Um, so, the pneumonia vaccine, uh, again, 65 and older, to protect from um, bacterial infection called sepsis, which this bacteria can cause meningitis or the brain infection and pneumonia. There are two kinds, the Prevnar 13 and the Pneumovax 23. And the names simply are the 13 protects against 13 types of bacteria, the pneumovax 23 against 23 types of pneumococcal bacteria. And um, 
here is again just showing you the incidence and mortality, which is the death rate of invasive pneumococcal disease. So this is when you end up with the pneumonia and uh, the meningitis. If you look down here and you look at people above 65, look how it's 142 when, you know, that's your number when you're young and it goes up to 1,292. And again, the deaths, about 5% of them will die. So over 1,000 will end up with serious disease and 5%. So you can see as you get older, your chances of getting serious forms of the disease increase and your chances of death with it increase, which is why, again, it is encouraged to get the pneumonia, um, pneumonia vaccine. So this is what we were talking about, the Pregnar 13. It's called the conjugate vaccine. And then you have the Pneumovac 23. And I'll just show you very briefly what is the difference between them. So this is the conjugate, the Prevnar 13. And that's the one we give uh, infants and toddlers. And it does produce antibodies in the healthy. Now, the Pneumovac 23 does too. Both of these will do it, but we do not offer this to the young kids, the Pneumovac 23, because it will not produce the desired response. Now, if you look down here, you see a lot of yeses with the Prevnar 13. And what the reason we are now offering it to those 65 and older is because we have realized it decreases colonization. So what's colonization? Our nose, for instance, may harbor bacteria. They really don't do much. The trouble is that these bacteria in the nose, when you are sick or just exposed to somebody who is sick, you could transmit infections. So the idea is that these particular bacteria that are in the nose are actually uh, decreased when you take the Prevnar. And that's a big advantage because they found out that the kind of pneumonia you end up getting when they correlated it often matched what was in the nose. So it's not that everybody who has bacteria in the nose will end up getting sick, but if you do end up getting sick, it often matches what you already had. So the benefit of this vaccine is that it decreases the bacterial count in the nose. It exhibits herd effect again. The word herd, we often associate with cattle, but it really is used a lot in humans when it comes to vaccines saying, if a few people are vaccinated, that's great. Some are protected in the community. But the more people that are vaccinated, the more people in the community are protected. So um, with polio, there is herd immunity. The polio vaccine with influenza, there is. Because uh, it, it's just because the, the person takes the vaccine, the virus is in their body secretions, and really helps protect those they come in contact with. So it is a true entity. And so not just do you benefit yourself, you are protecting others in the community by being vaccinated. So that herd effect is seen with this one, the Prevnar 13. And, um, and we will show in the next slide, again, it's a busy slide, but I just want to point out, so this is the Prevnar 13. This is the pneumococcal vaccine we typically know. Anyone over 65 is recommended to get both of them. There are certain recommendations of who should get one and who should get the other, but really what, what you need to remember is if you're over 65, it is just get, good to get both kinds of the vaccine, the 23 as well as the 13. Again, you just need to talk to your doctor. There is a certain time interval between the vaccines. So if you got the 23 today, you need to wait sometimes even a year before you can get the 13. But if you got the 13 first, you can actually get the other one in a couple of months. So it all depends on the doctors know which one um, you know, you've received and how to time the next. Also, often you end, if you end up in hospital and you're asked, have you, have you gotten the pneumonia vaccine? Remember, if you're over 65, you receive the pneumonia vaccine once. Please don't get it every time you're in the hospital. Please don't get it every time you're sick. It is crazy. How many people will get four doses of the pneumonia vaccine for no reason? So you need it once after 65. If you got it before 65, uh, you do need to take a second dose because the immunity does wane. But if you're an otherwise healthy individual or even with just you know asthma or diabetes or some diseases of that nature, just one dose after 65. Now, if you are someone whose spleen is removed or there are other conditions where you may need more than that, but again, those we get into um, a little more complicated discussion 
But as far as you are concerned, you don't need the pneumonia vaccine every year like you do the flu, okay? Because the pneumonia vaccine doesn't change like we have the flu viruses, which just get smarter every year. So it's just a different, uh, different ball game there. But uh, this is the immunocompromised person. This is the individual who has HIV, leukemia, lymphoma. Really, we're talking about Hodgkin's disease conditions where you are taking a lot of immunosuppressive medications. Uh, for psoriasis, for rheumatoid arthritis, you know, you will need both before 65 even. It, that is something you have to talk with your doctor. Um, now, HPV, again, this is not really a vaccine um, recommended for anyone beyond this age group, which is uh, females 11 to 12 to about 26 years, and males to about 21 years, um, and then of course if they have HIV till 26. The only reason I brought it up is if you have daughters, you know, just if you want to educate someone in the community, HPV stands for human papillomavirus. This is what causes in females the cervical cancer, the vaginal cancer, and uh, in males it causes uh, the penile or cancer of the mm -hmm. penis. Both in males and females, it can cause anal cancer and the genital wart. So it is for, it's good to take this vaccine for this particular age group. If you're wondering why shouldn't everyone take it, why just this age group? Uh, the idea is that by the time you have, they say even 40s, been exposed to pretty much all these kinds of HPV viruses, that there is no benefit in giving you the vaccine. Because this vaccine, if you have a wart already, won't protect you from that wart, won't protect you from that particular strain of virus, but will protect you from future events. So if you've been exposed to all of them, giving you the vaccine gives you no benefit really because you've been exposed to all of them. So they have a specific age group they're trying to target before they end up being really sexually active and getting all the kinds of different illnesses associated with the viruses. So um, at this point, the studies have shown this is the age group in which it is beneficial, but clearly it is beneficial in this particular age group. So I wanted to just bring that up there if there was a question, if you know, if you all had someone who had brought it up, if you ever wondered who needs the vaccine and why shouldn't you get it. Um, this is my last slide, just ending up with something life without vaccination. So this is Molly the cow. She's a very healthy cow. <laughs> Um, but even very healthy cows can get sick and she catches a viral infection. Well, this virus is known to kill very young cows, very old cows, and cows that are already sick, which is typically what viruses will do. They attack the very young, the very old, and those who are on you know, different medications from chronic diseases. So luckily, Molly is not very young or in that particular group, so she's okay. She just feels miserable for a week. And then she visits her friends in the field, but unfortunately, her three friends were not vaccinated because Farmer Joe didn't vaccinate his cow. So they all got sick. And now they've spread the viruses around. Most of the cows are sick. Most of the herd survives, but many babies and older cows die. So that's the sad truth, but it is the truth. So we really have to take this seriously. Our job is to educate those where there is a lot of anti-vaccine information out there. And it's sad. It's sad because it's very confusing. And it's sad because it's so compelling when you present stories about autism and you start wondering, should I take it? But again, I think the best place to visit is CDC. It does try to give as much information that's out there in a, in a language that's very understandable. So a lot of these slides are from CDC and another site up to date, which is a medical site that I've taken information from. But um, that was really the end of the talk, and now I am open to questions. Oh, here, here's, yeah, actually there was another cartoon I had to pick up because um, this is a mom who says, my son is deathly allergic. I cannot have some other child bring these to school and risk my son's health. That's mixed nuts. The son has a peanut allergy. But when the same mom is said, look, told, look, vaccinate your child to protect others, she says, I don't care if my kid gets your kid sick. Ain't nobody vaccinating my child. Yeah. So that is just plain nuts, right? Yeah. That's it. All right. I am open to any questions you all have. And I just hope this gave you all some information, hopefully a little more. 
Uh, or at least confirmed the, you know, some of the um, knowledge you already had. So, anybody has any questions? I do. You said um, to get a vaccination with shingles when you've had them, it's a different strain. Is it still just you just go in and get the shingle shot and it'll cover everything? Right? Yes. It's not yeah. a different one. Yeah. No, no. Okay. So just one shot and, um, and yeah, and it doesn't matter that you've gotten it because the two things it helps with is the shingles, of course, but it also protects... Uh, uh, from the, what's called the post-herpetic neuralgia, which is really the back pain associated yeah. with shingles. So uh, even if you may see blisters and you say, mm -hmm. geez, why did I take the shot? I still got it. It's a much, much milder form of the disease. Okay. And that's a lot of the time what we're trying to do with vaccines is, is to educate people who tell you, geez, you know, I, I got it still, even though I took this to tell them. What you don't understand is the flu is not just the, the body aches or the runny nose, the fever that makes you stay in bed a few days you can end up with a serious bacterial infection, and that's encephalitis that can kill you. You can end up with a bad pneumonia that can end, you know, leave you on a ventilator that can kill you. So the point being, we are not just trying to prevent the simple flu. We are trying to prevent complications, and that's the same with really any vaccine, uh, even with shingles. So even if you've got a milder form of it, what we're really trying to prevent is what we call disseminated or just okay. shingles all over. Thank okay. You very much. Any other questions? Yeah, is polio vaccine good for life? Yes. <clears throat> so um, we, everybody uh, gets the inactivated polio strain in this country, uh, which is the killed vaccine. And yes, you are protected because you get four doses of it as a child. So you should be good. And the good thing is there was a time people actually saw deaths related to the disease. I can remember that. So y'all would never be in the group of people hopefully advocating don't vaccinate because you saw what it did when you did not vaccinate. The trouble now is we managed to eradicate. This is the problem. We eradicated polio in almost every country except a couple. I think Afghanistan had a couple of cases in somewhere in Africa. The point being we had done so good. When we eradicate it, nobody else gets it. And how did we eradicate it? By catching all the little young kids and making sure they got it. But now the trend's changing. But at this point, the vaccination we've all received in childhood should protect us. So, how about measles? So I had the measles. I had all all the kinds of measles, but I've never been vaccinated. Should I be concerned about catching measles at my age? Um, <clears throat> so you know that is actually how old are you? Seventy-two. Okay, so the MMR vaccine, which is what uh, is given to protect against measles, they do recommend another dose of it in your adulthood. I personally think if you have had measles, I, I don't think you need a, what's called a booster dose. Okay. So, for instance, I got a single dose of it. I've never had the measles. So when I was an adult, they did, I did get a second booster. So some of it is if you've never had the disease. If you've had the disease, truly it is very protective. Well, I had what they used to call the red measles, and then they had the German measles. That's so right. it was two different. Mm -hmm. yeah. had them both. Wow. They, so used you... to, they used to take kids to school and expose them so that they would all be out of school at the same time. I did not know yeah. that here in the U.S. Really? Sure. Right down the road in Decatur, Georgia. That was vaccine. Yeah, that was a vaccine. But do you know they do that now? So there are parents who are against vaccines who hold measles parties. And, yeah. and uh, the idea is the one child is vaccinated, or is, get, has the disease, and the parent of this group will tell every parent to bring your child there to get the disease. The trouble that people don't realize is one of those may end up with the bad brain infection. So it really isn't a good idea because it may be lucky if everyone just got the measles, but we've come a long way. We invented a vaccine just to prevent bad brain damage. And it is horrible when the brain gets infected. Mm -hmm. So it is, it is, that is interesting though. I, I did not know that it, it was actually done. So um, any other questions? What is the main objection to the vaccinations so in this period of time <laughs> so here is the chair and again that's a very insightful question the problem is autism we are very aware of it and different studies have shown that there is a so this is where it started from that people picked up autism in this age group of about two years about the time MMR vaccine is given which is about 18 months and uh, 
very unfortunate that somebody came up with this idea that these two are linked. Now, this is how good <laughs> research is done, and it would have been okay if that was all it was. So this particular physician in the United Kingdom um, um, basically came up with a paper in Lancet, which is a very reputable medical journal, that it is the vaccine that causes autism. Now, it created a big furor. A lot of people stopped vaccinating their kids now. Just to make sure you'll understand, that paper was retracted by the journal and the doctor lost his license. However, the damage was done because a lot of people started thinking, good grief, this makes sense. My child has given 10 vaccines and now my child was good today and won't speak. Now, the problem with autism is even yet today, despite all the studies out there, we think there are a lot of factors. There are genetic factors, environmental, we cannot pick a single factor. CDC did research that proves it is not MMR that causes autism. We, there was a concern the mercury in these vaccines can cause autism, and actually we have now preservative-free vaccines. So we try to allay fears, and there is enough literature out there that says, look, these two aren't linked, and here's the beauty. The autism community has said, go vaccinate your kids. This is not linked to the vaccine, but some celebrities with a loud voice will go about saying things that don't poison your children. And <clears throat> interestingly, it's always people who have not seen the dis what the disease does. I come from India, and I've seen what polio does. To me, if you tell me I won't vaccinate my child, I mean, it, it, it saddens me because it's so preventable to not have your child be limp or lame or end up with a bad brain infection where they stay like that for life. So I have seen the worst of the disease. Here we're seeing a, put, a concerning, we don't know, maybe link to a vaccine, but what we've proven is it's an association. It's happening at this time. It doesn't mean it's a cause. And that's the hard part that when we find something linked to, in that time period, we say, good grief, is it the vaccine? And that spreads a lot of rumors and a lot of fears. And again, there are movies coming out that don't support vaccination. It is very sad. Uh, I, I don't know if you all heard of the measles outbreak in Disneyland. Um, so it's, it's so sad, right? You take your kids, grandkids, what have you, to a fun place and come back with measles because of the same thing. Parents were not vaccinating their children and taking these children out to these kind of group events. And, um, you know, if your kid is four months, you cannot vaccinate them against mm -hmm. the measles, mumps, or rubella. They're too young. And they are now exposed to somebody who has the disease mm -hmm. or is in what's called the incubation period. So they don't show the actual rash, but they can infect somebody who's not protected. So it is a very sad thing that people who don't completely understand it go about saying, you know, you don't need to put all these poisons in your kids. And the truth of it is, yes, as a parent, it concerns everyone if they tell you your child needs 10 shots. You know, they're trying to combine it, so it's just three shots and not 10 different vaccines at the same time. But again, this is to prevent the worst. And uh, we just have to have faith in the system, but apparently um, there are a lot of people. And interestingly, you would think over time, uh, this would, the trend would change, but we have actually more people now the group against vaccines is increasing. Mm -hmm. so it's, it is yeah. sad, but, um, but it is what it is. So we, we just want this word out in the community saying, look, if you have questions or doubts, that's what health work care workers are for. Um, this particular study that caused this whole autism link, that doctor was paid to do the study, guess by who? The lawyers of the parents who felt vaccines caused autism. So they went to these lawyers. The lawyer paid this doctor to say, can you do a study to see if there's a link? And if you prove a link, you know, there's a hefty sum for you in it, because we're gonna sue the vaccine companies. So it is very sad that it was not ethical, which is why the study was removed. But again, we don't hear all of that. We just hear, uh, and, and really there are a lot of celebrities out there who say, I won't poison my child. There are politicians who say it, and it is a lack of information, but, um, you know, it is what it is. It is out there. So we can arm ourselves by being educated, you know, and um, educating others that, look, if you have questions, read valid websites, not, you know, websites that spring overnight. Um, so CDC really is a good place to go if you all, you all have questions. A lot of this is patient information. They have questions and answers and uh, things of that nature. So.
Any other questions? The uh, pneumonia shot. Mm -hmm. it was, so through the years, it's been, it seemed to me, uh, not a, any kind of agreement among physicians or medical about getting one shot or, or if you have, when you, you, I believe you mentioned if you had it after you were 65, it should be good. Well, but some of them would say you need a booster after so long or this, that, and the other. So now you know this, and what you need to do is print out. So there are the schedules that are also on CDC. So basically, say, explain it. You know, and sometimes, you know, it could be a doctor is a little confused, too. You know. <laughs> I mean, I, I wouldn't, uh, my thing, so typically, if you're before 65 uh, and you got a single dose of it, you do need another one after 65. This is your pneumonia, the pneumococcal 23. Um, and now that the Prevnar has come about, it's a different kind of pneumonia vaccine, which you should get once. <coughs> but having said that, if you have other health conditions that your doctor feels is not protecting, and will not protect you enough, they may recommend additional but in most people, they just need one after 65, <coughs> a single. So I, yeah, I, you are correct though, there are a lot of people, and it makes me mad when I open a chart in a hospital and I see pneumonia, I give, I'm like, why do we give this every so? I think when you tell, if you are in the hospital and you tell them, look, I don't know, they'll give it. Yeah. <laughs> but if you do know, you don't need it again. So, um, you know. But the insurance company will pay for it, so a lot of times, they'll give you a, a, a shot or an injection because they can collect money from the insurance company. And I'll tell you, so this is more, see this is where there are two, two truths to this. So yes, you are correct, but do you know on the flip side what is the problem? And again, a lot of people were getting pneumonia in the older age group, dying from it or getting complications from it. So Medicare came up with this rule. A person in a certain age group comes into the hospital or with certain health conditions and you failed to ask them, did they get the pneumonia vaccine? Or you asked them and they said they don't know and you did not give it to them. You are dinged for this admission and we won't pay you because you didn't do due diligence of giving this patient the vaccine. So what do you think is the path of least resistance? <laughs> Everybody gets the vaccine. <laughs> That's the bottom line. So, you know, fighting this is hard because the, the way if you talk, when I go for the medical conferences and we do have people from CMSA, what they say is, look, it is very hard. There is no one right answer. They're saying, we're just trying to get, make sure everybody gets it. We're making sure the hospitals do their due diligence. But what's happening is you're sick. You're like, geez, I don't know. I may have gotten it. You know, I moved from another state. And the, uh, the actual, the conclusion to that discussion is patient needs a vaccine. <laughs> So it is, it is what it is, but it is because they're actually penalized if you don't get it. So while you, you feel, yes, they're getting reimbursed, the truth is if they didn't, the whole admission would be dinged. Yeah. So and these are charts that go to CMS, which hospitals, it's actually a questionnaire. If you understand what happens behind the scenes, some people are just uh, marking questionnaires. So a patient came in with A, a B, and C, got the flu shot, was offered the flu shot, took the flu shot, was offered the pneumonia shot, you know. Those are questions that are um, really marked on how good are you at preventing disease. So, um, you know, until that changes, you better be aware of what vaccines you got. <laughs> so you don't end up getting too many of the same for no reason, really. So, um, but yeah, so that, that is a good question. And, I, and, and trust me, I have seen it. So I know there are a lot of patients getting a lot of pneumonia vaccines. So. Mm. Anything else? I have one similar to what you're talking about now. <clears throat> it concerns me, not this group, if you're in a small group, mm -hmm. and somebody in there lets out everything that's coming up out of them, like blowing the breath and coughing, and don't cover them off, anything like that, and you're closed in, you're inhaling that. Now, what can you do for protection once you get home? Because you don't know what they got. So the simplest and best thing is hand hygiene. So if you make sure every time before you eat, and ideally if you can remember before you touch your face, mouth, your hands are clean. So hand sanitizer is good. And if your hands are visibly dirty, wash it. So amazingly, that simple thing goes a long way. So really most infections spread mouth, nose, because it's mucosa, eyes. 
So if you can just be aware of not, if you are in their vicinity, just go wash your hands and make sure you're not shaking hands with them and then eating food, blowing your nose, you know what I mean? You would be less likely to get infected. Keep up with your, you know, your own multivitamins, that kind of thing. But if you're otherwise feeling good and somebody is coughing, sneezing, yeah, I would stay away at least a couple of feet and not have them. Well, see, sometimes you just can't get up and walk out. They're doing what they do. And uh, you're sitting right there and you inhale it. Yeah, and I think you should, you don't have to be, um, you know, very um, paranoid, truly. If you're in any crowded place, there may be somebody who's sick that you don't even know. My thing always is when you just have a simple hand hygiene factors that you're sort of obsessive about, keep hand sanitizer with you, it does go a long, long way. So don't take care of anything I might have picked up from there. Yeah. Because I'm not a, a, a well person. Yeah, I mean, that so is... I have a lot of complaints. <laughs> yeah, I mean, no, that is that is very, very effective to keep good hand hygiene in mind. Uh, it does decrease it. Now, of course, if you're really sick and that person was really sick, you know, there's a potential you may still get it, but uh, that doesn't mean you shouldn't do what you can to protect yourself. So that's what I would basically do. And, um, and again, if you think this particular person is always coughing, whatever, you may wear a mask. So you're well, not. Well, you never know. Like, I don't know anybody here today, but this lady right here, I don't know whether they cough or not. <laughs> yeah, but she's not. So the good thing is she's not coughing right now. I she's she not. Is. Yeah. So. Yeah, I mean, we can't, we all go to, you know, church, public places, we are in crowds, we can't live in paranoia. Well, I just want to know what I can do once I get home and show that I didn't pick up something. Yeah, basic thing, keep your hand, hand hygiene goes a long, long way. Okay. <coughs> all right, anything else? All right, then. Thank, Thank you all so you. much Thank for you. coming. <laughs>